Hello, this is your professor, Michael Stramiska. Welcome to Neo-Paganism and New Religious Movements Week 1, where we will introduce ourselves and explore some basic concepts of the course and look at the syllabus. Every week, there will be a PowerPoint lecture like this. It will be provided in four formats. First, as a narrated PowerPoint lecture, which is available either as a, a PowerPoint presentation or as a video saved in the MP4 file format. Also, as a silent PowerPoint version and as a PDF format file, which is best for printing. To get the full effect, it is best to use the narrated version either as PowerPoint, which has a special use of allowing precise stopping on specific slides or repeating them very easily, or you can observe the presentation as a video, which is best for passive viewing or listening. The silent versions, either as PowerPoint or PDF, are great for when you don't want to listen to anything, just view the images and read the text. Let's begin by defining terms, because after all, any serious academic inquiry needs to begin by defining key terms that the discussion revolves around. And some of our key terms are religion, big surprise, eh? Cult, the bad kind of religion. New religious movement, a term you may not be familiar with, but which is widely used now as a less pejorative, more neutral term for new forms of religion that are sometimes considered cults. To begin with, let's look at some definitions of religion, starting with one from the Oxford English Dictionary. Number one, the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods, as in the relationship of science and religion. The etymological origin is believed to come from Middle English originally in the sense, life under monastic vows. Further back, coming from Latin, religio, meaning obligation, bond, or reverence, perhaps based on the Latin verb religare, to bind. 1.1, a particular system of faith and worship, the world's great religions. 1.2, a more contemporary application, a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance, as in consumerism is a new religion. And let's look at what Webster's has to say. Number one, belief in a divine or superhuman power or powers to be obeyed and worshiped as the creator or creators and ruler rulers of the universe. Number two, expression of this belief in conduct and ritual. Number three, A, any specific system of belief, worship, conduct, etc., often involving a code of ethics and a philosophy, such as the Christian religion, the Buddhist religion, etc. Three B, any system of beliefs, practices, ethical values, etc., resembling, suggestive of, or likened to such a system as in humanism is his religion. Four, a state of mind or a way of life expressing love for and trust in God. So looking at these different definitions, you see religion is a somewhat flexible category embracing a number of elements, all of which may be present or perhaps just some of them. Now let's look at some of the classic thinking about religion in modern times. And here I give you 
some definitions that come from William James, the American philosopher and psychologist, and Emile Durkheim, the great French sociologist, both from the late 19th century. According to William James, religion is the feelings, acts, and experiences of individual men, and I think he means to also include women, in their solitude, so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. And this comes from his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. So something useful that William James brings out is the experiential psychological aspect of religion, that it's something that goes on within ourselves, in our minds, our imaginations, our emotions. And James was especially interested in how religious experiences can transform individuals, often in very powerful and positive ways. Now, if we turn to Durkheim, he pushes in a different direction. His famous definition is, religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, that is, things set apart and forbidden and religion is beliefs and practices which unite into a single moral community called the church all those who adhere to them and this comes from his work the elementary forms of the religious life so durkheim puts it into a social context unlike james with his very individualistic perspective durkheim is interested how religion undergirds and reflects society by focusing on sacred things that then provide a common basis for a community of people or a society of people. So the social function is most important to Durkheim. And furthermore, Durkheim believed that what people actually worshiped in religion was the collective weight and force of society which was so powerful that people understood it as a god or godlike force. So between James and Durkheim, we see definitions that focus on different aspects. And I would note these two are not mutually exclusive at all. They're both useful. And they call our attention to different things that people do with religion. And to give you a, another couple of definitions from influential thinkers on religion, now we'll look at the Protestant theologian Paul Tillich and the great anthropologist Clifford Geertz. Tillich made the statement, religion is the state of being gripped by an ultimate concern. And this was in his 1957 book, Dynamics of Faith. So here, Tillich is pointing to the idea that religion is how we relate to the ultimate issues of existence, such as why are we here, what is life for, what happens after death, and so forth. I personally take some objection to this because I think while it is true that such ultimate concerns are part of religion, religion may also deal with things that are not so ultimate that are more every day and could even be silly. But Tillich is looking at, shall we say, the high end of the scale, the high stakes issue of what's it all about? What are we to live for? What happens after death and so forth? Now Clifford Geertz <clears throat> brings us in a different direction. It's more of a cognitive model that he provides, saying that religion is a system of symbols which acts to establish powerful, pervasive, and long-lasting moods and motivations in men. And I would hope he also <clears throat> means to say women or people. By formulating conceptions of a general order of existence and clothing these conceptions with such an aura of factuality that the moods and motivations seem uniquely realistic. 
So there is a lot packed in that definition. But a few things to note. He talks about it as a system of symbols. In other words, it's a kind of language that gives us a way to talk about life, the world, the universe, a way of packaging our understanding of life. And furthermore, this has important psychological effects. It creates pervasive and enduring moods and motivations. So it doesn't just give us a way to think about life, but a way to feel about it. And it directs us towards certain courses of action. And it does this by providing conceptions of a general order of existence. In other words, it provides us with a certain sense of the order of the world and a certain map of what is important in life. And then it takes these conceptions and makes them very attractive and compelling for us by packaging them with what he calls an aura of factuality. In other words, the religion may be relating to invisible or supernatural or mythological things, but it has a way of making them seem uniquely realistic and factual so that believers can feel confident that these things are real and true. And all this is from Geertz's great book, The Interpretation of Cultures. And now let me give you my own definition that I've developed over time. It's fairly simple, but I think it's useful for our purposes in the class like this. I would say that religion is the relationship of human beings towards someone or someone's or something or some things which they define as sacred. A religion provides its members a distinctive sense of identity, community, and purpose through shared activities, experiences, ideals, concepts, and narratives, all of which serve to reinforce the relationship to the sacred. And in place of the word sacred, you could say the divine or one's highest values or gods or whatnot. But the important point is it's something beyond the individual person, something greater that we find benefit in relating to. And now let's take up the term cult a very controversial term that many scholars would prefer to avoid because of its highly negative and pejorative meaning. But I have come to think that this may not be a term that we can get away from and maybe should not even try to get away from. Because despite the fact that it's a problematic term, it is so widely used in society to mean some kind of negative form of religion. And I think it does have a certain utility for us in that way. It is important to understand that the term cult has a long history and has had shifting meanings that have changed over time. <clears throat> in our recent language and in American culture and in many other societies as well, cult has come to mean new forms of religion that are viewed in a negative, pejorative way, or that are felt to be negative, dangerous things. And this actually contradicts the older meaning of the word cult, because originally it meant nothing negative or even positive, but simply any organized form of worship. And so the term did not imply any judgment about whether said form of worship was good or bad, desirable or undesirable. And once again, let's look at what the Oxford English Dictionary has to say about how the meanings of this term have evolved over time. <clears throat> 
First of all, number one, a system of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object, such as the cult of Saint Olaf. The origin, it's believed to come from the early 17th century, at least in English, and originally it denoted an homage or veneration paid to a divinity. Coming from French culta or Latin cultus, meaning worship, further derived from cult, meaning inhabited, cultivated, worshipped, from the verb colere. A further refinement or development of the meaning of cult 1.1, a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister, such as a network of Satan worshiping cults. And then a further development of the meaning, 1.2, a misplaced or excessive admiration for a particular person or thing, as in a cult of personality surrounding the leaders. So now let's turn to this other terminology that's developed of new religious movement. And the reason this term has developed is that scholars felt that cult had come to have an almost exclusively negative meaning and a more neutral term was desired for describing, well, as, as this terminology obviously means, a religious movement that is new. And we can abbreviate new religious movement as NRM. And an NRM generally is thought to have three components. It is new in that it's typically something recently created, although it may involve very old elements. In fact, there's often a recycling and a blending of elements taken from various religions. Secondly, it is in fact religious. It's about sacred or supernatural things, as we have discussed. And then, number three, it is a movement. It's not just one person's private belief or activity, but something that's shared among different people. And if we think about it, every religion that now exists in the world was once a new religious movement. The difference between an NRM and an established religion is simply duration and social acceptance. Christianity was once considered a weird and unimportant Jewish sect, but then it grew and gained numbers and support, gained power and influence, and then became a well-respected religion, although perhaps not so much among pagans. So comparing this term, new religious movement, versus the term cult, this term NRM, new religious movement, developed as a more neutral replacement for cult because the term cult had come to be used since the 1960s, 70s, and 80s as a pejorative label for new forms of religion and religious groups that are viewed as being outside of mainstream society and outside of established religions. So the word cult has by and large come to apply a group or religion seen as dangerous and antisocial. And in contrast, and this is the main point scholars have been driving at in creating this terminology, the phrase new religious movement withholds judgment and simply describes the social phenomenon of a new form of religion followed by a group of people. Rising interest in this area has led to the study of new religious movements, NRMs, becoming a distinct academic subfield within religious studies, that of new religions studies. And I would further comment that the study of pagan religions is a further subset of the study of NRMs. So let me explain how we'll apply this terminology in this course. Although the preferred academic term is NRM, New Religious Movement, 
due to the overwhelmingly negative associations that have come to attach to the term cult, we can still make use of this widespread, indeed inescapable term cult in a way that honors the modern popular understanding among the public and in the media. We can use cult to refer to NRMs that are believed to be or are proven to be socially dangerous and, and or psychologically destructive. And so NRM remains the primary term the broadest and most neutral term, and cult becomes a secondary term for the subclass of NRMs with antisocial or otherwise problematic characteristics. So you say tomato, I say tomato, when should we say NRM or cult? The following four factors can be used to determine if an NRM or other religious group should be called an NRM or a cult. One, the group constitutes a closed society in which members are cut off from their prior lives, families, and mainstream society. Two, the leader of the group exercises total control over the members, subordinating their will to his or her own. Three, the group employs extreme methods of indoctrination, which may be viewed as brainwashing. Four, the group is seen as dangerously antisocial, not merely opposing or providing an alternative to mainstream society, but seeking to undermine or destroy it through extreme means, including violence. And here are some important issues in new religion studies, which are also useful for us to ask in researching modern pagan movements. 1. Charismatic Founders. Was the New Religious Movement or Pagan Movement established by a single person with a very strong personality? How much control does she or he exert over members? Will the New Religious Movement survive the death of its founder or did it? 2. What's the appeal? What is the membership? Who does the movement appeal to and why? Young or old? socially successful individuals or marginal ones? Is there any particular psychological, social class, or ethnic profile that applies to members? Does the movement tend to cater to individuals, couples, or families? Three, identity, beliefs, behaviors. What is the New Religious Movement's own idea, own definition of its identity and purpose? Does it have a special story of its founding and development? What are the beliefs and rituals? Are they newly created or borrowed from other sources? Are there sacred texts? Four, organization and funding. How is the NRM organized and how does it support itself? Five, the public image. How is the movement perceived by the general society in positive, negative, or neutral terms? Is it accepted by government authorities or not? Six, methods of outreach. How does the NRM attract members? Through the internet, other social media, on the street proselytizing, telepathy, or what? Seven, is the NRM open or closed to society? Does it allow contact with mainstream society or does it isolate its members and force them to avoid such contact. Are members free to leave the new religious movement? Eight, the degree of involvement in the movement. Are there different levels of involvement of individuals in the, NR, in the NRM from full-time and intensive involvement and membership to only occasional participation and part-time membership? Are there core members? Are there casual members? So what is the profile? What's the degree of involvement of those involved? So these are some useful issues that apply to new religious movements that you could also apply to pagan movements. Another interesting issue for us to pay attention to is how 
The rise of new religious movements perceived as cults has led to a response from society, a negative, hostile response that we could characterize as an anti-cult movement in that there have been various actors and organizations in society that have sought to demonize religious movements and in some cases seem to have legitimate reasons to be concerned about such movements and then to seek ways to destroy the movements or to remove members and then alter their way of thinking to destroy their fidelity and participation in the movement. And that is often characterized as deprogramming members. Looking at all these different anti-new religious movement, anti-cult activities, we can characterize it in total as an anti-cult movement and abbreviate it as ACM. And this was at its peak in the 1970s and 80s. So the anti-cult movement is the name given by sociologists and scholars to designate the loose group of organizations and individuals who are opposing so-called cults, employing a very strong, sharp us versus them duality. The anti-cult movement is based on the notion of mind control. The fear that cults are able to take over the minds of its members. This is a concept that has been debunked in the 1980s and since, but is still alive in our pop culture and popular media. In its heyday, the ACM often resorted to conservatorship laws to get hold of cult members and forcibly remove and treat them. And then the ACM agents tried to legalize this practice by passing deprogramming laws. Deprogramming was the name given by a man named Ted Patrick in the early 70s. And he applied this to his own practice consisting of kidnapping members of religious cults or groups and subject, subjecting them to a constant barrage of arguments until they recanted their views. And you may notice a certain irony here that in attempting to disengage people from their religious beliefs and affiliations, Patrick was actually employing his own form of programming, but a counter-programming to what was believed to have taken place in these religious movements. And so this opens up the concept of brainwashing which has become very well entrenched in our culture and becomes a really thorny issue when we look at religions and how people get involved in religions. Because one person's brainwashing may to someone else just be a very reasonable teaching and indoctrination into the doctrines of the religion. The term brainwashing first developed during the Korean War to describe psychological techniques used by the communist Chinese to break down captured American soldiers resistance, to indoctrinate them with new ideologies and identities, and to coerce them into cooperating with the communist authorities. Mind control was another term that was developed to describe such techniques. So this was an actual thing that was happening in the Korean War. Popular culture in the, in the 50s and 60s often portrayed brainwashing as a danger to American society. And this was part of the Red Scare mentality of that period, raising the fear that communists or other nefarious forces could turn American cities into mindless zombies bent on destruction. Films like The Manchurian Candidate and TV shows like Star Trek helped to popularize this idea. In the 1960s, many Americans found the social upheavals of the time, from the civil rights movement to hippies to anti-war protests to the women's movement 
bewildering and frightening and saw in brainwashing a convenient explanation, seeing the 60s as one vast communist conspiracy. When young people began to join new religious movements like the Family of God and ISKCON, the Hare Krishna movement, brainwashing became a useful way to explain the seemingly strange and inexplicable success of these religious groups. In the 1970s and 80s, many new religious movements would be labeled as cults and as harmful and antisocial, and they were believed to brainwash and indoctrinate their members. There arose a class of anti-cult activists who developed ideas of counter brainwashing known as deprogramming intended to be a way to save people from the supposedly mind controlling cults. These activities taken together became known as the anti-cult movement, which we'll refer to as the ACM. The fear of brainwashing cults gradually died down in the 1980s and 90s with one major ugly exception, the satanic panic. The satanic panic episode deserves further examination because some of its elements and thinking still continue today. The satanic panic involved the prosecution of adults working with children for child abuse, <clears throat> usually based on highly questionable evidence, which was the testimony of children who it turns out had often been coached in remembering the supposed abuse. Speaking of memories that had actually been suggested to them by therapists or others. This practice has come in for scrutiny and now been rejected as manipulative, unreliable and unethical. And some of the discussion turns on such terms as planted memories and false memories that cannot be used in a legitimate courtroom. One such case took place in the 1980s involving Fells Acre, a daycare center in Malden, Massachusetts, outside of Boston, in which the proprietors, Gerald Amaralt, his sister Cheryl and his mother Violet were all accused of child abuse based on flimsy evidence. Cheryl spent nine years in prison, Cheryl, uh, Gerald spent 18. Their cases were eventually reopened. The evidence against them declared invalid because of this use of false or planted memories and all charges against them were dismissed. However, their accusers and prosecutors suffered no penalties. And this sets a dangerous precedent because such accusations can be used to destroy people and those who make the accusations may face no repercussions, which could be seen as an incentive to do this because those who want to destroy others in this way may lose nothing in the process. And to mention another case, in California, there was the McMartin case. And to quote from a news article, McMartin was one of the first multi-victim, multi-offender MVMO child abuse cases. It lasted six years, the longest U.S. criminal trial in history. At a cost to the state of $15 million, it was also the most expensive. No convictions were obtained. The main evidence of, of abuse was based on what the children testified were memories of repeated sadistic ritual molestation. Years later, child psychologists realized that such memories can be easily implanted in children's minds by the interview techniques which were used at the time. Since psychologists and police investigators have changed their methods of interrogating young children, no more MVMO cases have surfaced in the U.S.
and to go on with our account of brainwashing and anti-cult movement activities. Anti-gay, or more broadly speaking, anti-LGBTQ plus groups continue today to attempt to deprogram homosexuality, often through intensive religious indoctrination, in other words, brainwashing. In some states, these practices have been banned, made illegal by law, but many in America continue to promote and advocate these forms of so-called therapy, which could actually be seen as psychological abuse. Another anti-cult phenomenon involves anti-Islamic hysteria, often called Islamophobia, after 9-11-2001 when the, the terrible attacks happened in New York and elsewhere. Those attacks revived interest in the use of brainwashing and deprogramming techniques, both as something to use against Islamic terrorists and as something people feared were being used by Islamic terrorists. Government policy and media discussion of Islamic terrorism in the 2000s often focused on the real or imagined need to prevent supposed Islamic brainwashing, including the very popular sleeper cell idea and the need to deprogram former terrorists. The Afghan and Iraq wars saw U.S. military and intelligence services resorting to harsh interrogation techniques to psychologically dominate and even break down suspected Islamic terrorists and force their confessions and cooperation. And this could be seen as a kind of U.S. government, U.S. military sponsored brainwashing. And bringing this discussion closer to the present, I'll make some comment on political trends of recent times. The political ascent of Donald Trump in 2015-2016 brought with it a surge of right-wing, anti-government, anti-minority sentiments and ideology across American society, which many have interpreted as a kind of brainwashing. QAnon and right-wing conspiracy theory groups, remember Pizzagate, have proliferated on social media and right-wing news outlets like Fox and shown real power to influence national politics in the USA and beyond. The right-wing conspiracy theory bubble has proven highly resistant to any attempts to disprove its sacred doctrines of COVID denial and anti-vaccine beliefs, the supposedly stolen election of 2020, Trump's quasi-messiah status for some of his followers, and other such false narratives promoted by Trump, Fox, and allied forces. Some new age and alternative health gurus and influencers have also promoted a conspiratorial worldview for profit and popularity. And this phenomenon has now come to be studied under the label of conspirituality, that is, the intersection of conspiracy theory and New Age spirituality. And there is a podcast on this topic that I will recommend to you if you're interested. This was developed by a number of researchers into the interaction between right-wing paranoid views and New Age health and spirituality movements. And this podcast is called Conspirituality. So if you're interested in this social socio-religious trend, this podcast is for you. And here is the link. But let me emphasize, it's not required for this class. I'm just offering this as something additional if you have the interest. And speaking of cults, let me point to something happening in our culture and society now that could possibly be considered a kind of cult. And I would call this a cult of technologism in which many people 
place great faith in technology as this wonderful magical force that can shape our world and save us from our worst problems. And I would note that when we think of high tech as a kind of cult, for quite some time until his death, the, one of the founders of the Apple company, Steve Jobs, was elevated to a very high position as if he were some kind of guru or god of tech. So was Steve Jobs a kind of guru of a tech cult? Well, consider these very emotional and deeply felt reactions to his death in 2011. President Obama said Steve was among the greatest of American innovators, brave enough to think differently, bold enough to believe he could change the world, and talented enough to do it. New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, again and again over the last four decades, Steve Jobs saw the future and brought it to life long before most people could even see the horizon. California Governor Jerry Brown. Steve Jobs was a great California innovator who demonstrated what a totally independent and creative mind can accomplish. Few people have made such a powerful and elegant imprint on our lives. And last but not least, President, former presidential candidate Mitt Romney. Steve Jobs is an inspiration to American entrepreneurs. He will be missed. So there certainly was, at the very least, a kind of hero cult, to mention another term that where cult pops up, a hero cult around Steve Jobs. And I would say it relates to what could be considered a kind of religion of technologism, the faith in the supernatural power of technology. And now I will ask you to observe a moment of silence in honor of our great hero, our guru of technology, our savior, Steve Jobs. But Steve Jobs is so 1990s we need a new tech god or tech guru. Does this guy fit the bill? Elon Musk, is he our tech god for the 2020s? And here I'll make a few further comments on the anti-cult movement. Counter movements opposing new or growing churches and religious movements actually have a long history in American society. In the 19th century, counter movements opposing Mormonism and Catholicism were particularly well organized and influential. And then, as we have seen during the 1970s, a new counter movement, the anti cult movement, emerged to target the increasing numbers of new religious movements that gained adherence in the wake of the declining 1960s counterculture. The anti-cult movement actually embraces a large number of different ideas and organizations. It's probably fair to describe it as a loosely linked network of counter movement organizations with both religious and secular components. The ACM's religious wing is made up primarily of conservative Christian organizations that oppose new religious movements on theological grounds. And they do this through their church networks and through printed literature and other means. The first organization in the activist secular wing of the ACM was Free the Children of God, FreeCog, which was established in 1971 in response to the recruitment of young adults by the Children of God, a group later renamed the Family International. The Children of God, or the Family, deserves 
a little more attention from us as in some ways it prefigures pagan movements that would arise in the same period or afterwards. Although, of course, this is a movement with a biblical basis rather than coming out of European mythology and folklore, as is the case with most pagan movements. So what was this? It was a Christian-based religious movement with hippie aspects formed in the late 60s by a man named David Berg. The movement was focused on fostering love of God and Jesus through unconventional means, most famously the so-called flirty fishing, in which family members, usually women, use sexual means to entice people into the cult or new religious movement. In this way, Berg creatively and cleverly blended the free love ethos of the 1960s with Christian evangelicalism. Women members in particular were pressured to engage in sexual activities for the purpose of proselytizing and fundraising. Pregnancies from this kind of sacred prostitution were encouraged and the offspring were welcomed as Jesus babies who would be new recruits for the movement from the moment of their birth. And here we have some images of David Berg and his family international movement. Another interesting California based cult or new religious movement was the so called Source family. Rather similar to the family international, but with a different style of religion more focused on Eastern and New Age ideas, the Source family is a group started by Jim Baker, a charismatic World War II veteran who became a Hollywood stuntman in the 1950s, who became a vegetarian restaurateur in the 1960s, and around this restaurant developed this religious group in which he took a leading, indeed rather dictatorial role and called himself Father Yod. A quite amazing documentary about this cult or religious movement based on videos shot by many of the members is called The Source Family and it's available on Amazon video streaming service and is recommended for this class. Another major religious scandal would involve the Catholic Church. But first, let's reflect. The satanic panic and the child abuse hysteria of the 1980s, 1990s cast a long shadow of suspicion over many new religious movements, especially pagan revival movements involving the worship of pagan gods and goddesses, which many perceived and still perceive today as devil worship. Many pagan groups have found that they have had to constantly fend off accusations of satanic practices and worship, along with fears of child abuse. Meanwhile, in the later 1990s, it came to light that massive sexual abuse, including child rape, had been taking place for decades, not in a cult or a new religious movement or a neo-pagan group, but in the seemingly respectable Catholic Church. Investigations exposed not only widespread abuse by Catholic priests, but decades of concealment and cover-up quite unlike the kind of treatment the Amaralts had received. So let's look at this Catholic sex abuse scandal in the light of what we've been discussing about cults, new religious movements, the anti-cult movement and the satanic panic. <clears throat> in the case of the Catholic clergy sex abuse scandal, the Catholic Church has actually functioned much like a so-called dangerous cult. <clears throat> its leadership sealed itself off from outside scrutiny, demanded absolute loyalty from its members, 
allowed its higher level officials to abuse Catholic children with little fear of reprisals or punishment, and then covered up and even rationalized the abuse. Furthermore, the religious education which many abused Catholic children had received, which trained them to obey Catholic clergy without question as agents of the Christian God, could very reasonably be seen as brainwashing or mind control, except that this is a dominant majority religion in our society, so it is not subjected to such interpretations and accusations, at least not by most people. Majority religions get a pass for things that minority religions can be harshly punished for. Considering the antisocial abusive practices that were displayed in this Catholic clergy sex abuse scandal, one might justifiably propose that the Catholic Church itself should be considered a dangerous cult. And indeed, the Catholic Church has paid a price both for its abuse and for its concealment and refusal to come to terms with this abuse. The outrage against the Church has lasted until the present day, with many cases still in the courts and the Catholic Church having to pay out millions in compensation to its former victims. The 1990s was also a very lively decade for some tragic, infamous incidents involving new religious movements or cults. <clears throat> and these include the violent standoff with the Branch Dravidian movement in Waco, Texas in 1993, the Om Shinrikyo attack on the Tokyo subway system with nerve gas in 1995, and the mass suicide of the Heaven's Gate group in San Diego, California in 1997. Though the reputation of the Catholic Church was damaged by its pedophilia scandals, there was no call to abolish Catholicism. In contrast, the Branch Davidians were burned alive in a botched FBI raid, and the leaders of Om Shinrikyo have been sentenced to death. And this shows us how a religious group is judged depending very much on its relationship to mainstream society. The Catholic Church is seen as a pillar of society. So when bad things happen in the Catholic Church, it tends to be seen as caused by a few bad apples that just have to be sorted out. But when bad things happen with new religious movements, they are seen as threats to order and may be dealt with quite harshly. Here we see images of the attack on the Branch Davidian cult or new religious movement in Waco, which has had a long-term influence on right-wing paranoid views of the government and the need that many right-wing Americans feel for Americans to arm themselves as much as possible against possible assault by the government, as happened in Waco. However, let's not forget that the Branch Davidians were involved in what could be seen as the sexual abuse of female children, and that they were indeed amassing a huge arsenal of weapons that government authorities had a legitimate interest in being concerned about. So it's not a black or white issue here. The members of the Branch Davidian cult did suffer and die because of the FBI assault. But then again, the FBI and others had reasons to be concerned about what was happening in this isolated religious movement that indeed had all the markings of a dangerous cult. Om Shinrikyo 
which Time Magazine here calls a cult of doom, led by the, the Japanese religious leader who started off actually as a masseuse and yoga teacher named Shoko Asahara, is another case where government action could be seen as excessive, but on the other hand, this is a religious movement that was building up a massive arsenal that had ideas about overturning the government and indeed creating a world war. And so it truly had dangerous elements and it's understandable the government would be concerned about it. And then after the sarin gas attack on the Tokyo subway, there was no doubt this was a very dangerous movement. And so in a number of these cases, we see that there's a difficult dilemma here. When is it appropriate for the government to take action against a religious movement? And when is it not? We can look back to the satanic panic and see a case where fears of individuals were distorted, magnified, exaggerated, or simply invented and this was used for the government to take action against people and destroy their lives through imprisonment or damage to reputation or otherwise. But if we look at the Branch, the branch Davidians and Om Shinrikyo, we have to acknowledge that religious movements really can be dangerous. And would it be correct for the government to just sit back and let them do whatever they wanted? So these are difficult issues, and they do also apply to pagan religious movements. With Heaven's Gate, the cult or movement led by Marshall White, which ended with a terrible mass suicide of its members, we have a case where the government took no action that caused the violence or the death in this movement. The suicide was the plan of the leader and the members of the group followed him into death. This raises a different dilemma. Should perhaps the government have taken action against this movement considering what it led up to? But before there is any harm, what basis for government intervention would there be? Would it not be an undue <clears throat> intervention into a religious movement if it's not doing anything wrong. Again, difficult issues. Now let's take stock of the anti-cult movement today, which is not really a single movement, but more <clears throat> a combination of different social factors that are still very concerned with the possibility of dangerous cults. So the very fierce anti-cult passions and suspicions of the 80s and 90s have largely died down, but they have not disappeared altogether. There are still anti-cult organizations, activists, and indeed entrepreneurs, people who can actually make money out of the fear of cults. And all of these different agents are marketing fears of cults and offering supposed solutions, including deprogramming. But their profile and influence is overall less than in the past. However, in a more informal way, the anti-cult movement may be even more powerful today in that many of its ideas and attitudes have become common in American popular culture. Images of cults and brainwashing are often utilized for enter entertainment purposes in fiction, on film, in television programs, etc. And we also saw in the 2000s and carrying over into the 2000 teens, many of the old anti-cult fears and pre preconceptions were transferred to extreme Islamic religious groups, such as Al Qaeda and ISIS, with some viewing Islam itself as a dangerous cult. Christian groups in America continue to attempt to deprogram homosexual lifestyles and desires with pseudo psychological methods that have actually been rejected by mainstream psychiatry. 
On the other hand, it's important to acknowledge certain points. Although there are indeed highly questionable aspects of the anti-cult movement and its key concepts of cult, brainwashing, mind control, and deprogramming, there were also some really valid concerns that were raised by the anti-cult movement about certain new religious movements or cults. There are indeed new religious leaders who seek, who abuse and seek total control over the members of their groups, including deceptive recruitment practices and intensive indoctrination, which could be described as brainwashing. There are new religious movements that have engaged in unquestionably antisocial actions, from mass murder to group suicide. And so we have to face the fact that some new religious movements really can be harmful to their own members and or the larger society. And so the rights and status of new religious movements in any society are likely to always be open to question and suspicion, but religious tolerance dictates that they be treated fairly and not be prejudiced to be harmful or antisocial without any real evidence to that effect. Again, difficult dilemmas when it comes to religion in society. In this class, we'll take the following approach. In looking at new religious movements, including neo-pagan or modern pagan or pagan revival movements, we will attempt to take a neutral view of them as social and religious phenomena whose purpose, value, and impact can only be understood by close attention and careful analysis, but which are indeed always open to interpretation. Studying new religious movements reveals the amazing variety of human needs and interests, hopes and anxieties that are served by religion today as in the past. All new religious movements, including Christianity in its early days, challenge the existing social order and offer alternative visions of life and society. A so-called cult could be a mere passing protest or social experiment, or the beginning of a whole new trend in a culture. And to say a bit about my personal perspective, I myself have been involved with various modern or neo-pagan groups for many years, both as a scholarly observer and as a participant. I have been both an advocate and a critic of pagan religious movements at different times. I have researched and published about the Ausatru movement in Iceland and elsewhere, the Romova movement in Lithuania, and also the Dievturi movement in Latvia, which shares many similarities with Romova. And now, going back to very basic definitions, Let's look at one of our very much key terms, paganism. The terms pagan and paganism can carry both positive and negative meanings, depending on the point of view. In a positive sense, paganism refers to pre-Christian, polytheistic, nature-worshipping religions of ancient Europe or elsewhere, assuming that alternatives to Christianity polytheism and nature worship are seen as valid forms of religious life. In a negative sense, paganism also refers to pre-Christian polytheistic nature-centered religions of ancient Europe or elsewhere, assuming that alternatives to Christianity such as polytheism and nature worship are viewed as invalid and sinful. And so we see that paganism has been both romanticized and demonized and continues to be so. And so there are both positive and negative associations that attach to pagans and paganism. On the positive side, paganism is often associated with nature, ecology, sexuality, romantic views of rural life and the past, mythology, folklore, gender equity, or female primacy. 
On the negative side, paganism is often associated with devil worship, Satan and Satanism, reckless sexuality, human sacrifice, false gods, general immorality. And looking again at definitions of pagan from the Oxford Dictionary, 1a, a person holding religious beliefs other than those of the main world religions. 1.1, a non-Christian. 1.2, an adherent of neo-paganism. The origin, looking back to late Middle English, the term derives from the Latin paganus, meaning villager, rustic, from Pagus, country district. And in Latin, Paganus or Paganus also has the meaning of civilian, non-military, becoming in Christian Latin heathen with the sense of one who is not a member of the army of Christ. And here is a more developed definition from the New World Encyclopedia. Paganism, from the Latin paganus, meaning a country dweller or rustic, is a term that has been used from antiquity to derogatorily denote polytheistic faiths. Since the term was typically used as a blanket statement to circumscribe all non-Christian or more broadly non-monotheistic faiths, it served the same pejorative purpose as the Jewish term Gentile, the Islamic notions of infidel and kafir, and the multi-purpose term even. Due to these historically problematic connotations and usages, ethnologists and anthropologists avoid the term paganism when referring to traditional or historic faiths, preferring to utilize more precise categories such as polytheism, shamanism, pantheism, or animism. Thus, the term's connotations are both stark and polarizing, as it has been used to criticize and demonize the adherents of non-Christian faiths since the first century CE. And here is something plucked off the internet to give a humorous view of how people look at pagans and how pagans may look at themselves. And so we come to the end of this introductory lecture. Some points I'd like you to keep in mind going forward in this course. First, in the academic study of religions, modern pagan or neo-pagan religions are a subset of the larger category of new religious movements. New religious movements are often termed cults in everyday speech and in the media with a quite negative connotation. We will use the term cult in this class in a limited way to refer to new religious movements, pagan or other, that exert excessive control over members and or are harmful to individuals or society by promoting violence, death, or other antisocial attitudes or actions. So that's it for now. See you soon.